morning. I'm talking to you today about Irish megalithic art, passage to art. The papers are dealing, for the most part, with open air rock art, but it was thought that this would be an interesting subsection or com comparable material to discuss. I'm going to be talking mostly about Ireland, but uh, mentioning Northwest Britain and Orkney, where similar carvings occur. And they occur also in, in Brittany and down into Western Spain and Portugal. I'm also going to look briefly at the possible relationships between megalithic art and rock art in Ireland. In recent years, I've had the privilege of working on the remarkable megalithic art, which was found from excavations conducted by Professor George Ogan at Nauth in County Meath. He found two long passage tombs and those two tombs and the surrounding curbstones and this, a number of small tombs around the big mound all have um, carvings amounting to nearly 500 carved surfaces in all. It makes up almost half the whole <clears throat> repertoire of carvings in, in Ireland. The complete catalogue of these carvings will be published later this year by the Royal Irish Academy. Some of my slides are going to give you a preview of illustrations in, in the book, but please be aware that it's not yet published and they mustn't be reproduced uh, at this point until they're actually published. I'm grateful to the Academy for allowing me to, to show them to you here today. Photographs were all taken by Ken Williams, a leading photographer in this area. He's contributed several hundred photographs to the NELS report. Now, NELS and Newgrange and another site called Douth are well-known passage tombs within the Bend of the Boyne in County Meath in Eastern Ireland. And Nauth in particular, as I've said, has a large number of stones carved and so does Newgrange and some of the others have smaller numbers. Here's a summary of the actual numbers. And you can see the red is, is Nauth, the big tomb, solid red, the smaller tomb is a pinky color. Newgrange is yellow, 150 carved stones, and then Douth in green has, has smaller numbers. So over 600 carved stones in the Boyne Valley, or Bruna Boyne, as it's called. In Ireland, generally, um, we've, we've put those numbers in for comparison with other sites in Ireland, and you can see how, how they dominate, particularly in Douth, with 46% of all the carved stones in the country. The other important site that I'll be mentioning later on is Loch Crew, which is over to the west, northwest of the Boyne Valley. And the other site of interest is Loch Row in the south, where about 40 stones are shortly to be published by the excavator of that site, Dr. Marisha Sullivan. Well, the carvings are <clears throat> best classified into, we think about nine or 10 groups, I, I would say nine. You could divide them and subdivide them further, but in general terms, what we have are circular motifs, concentric circles or single circles, spirals, wavy lines, serpentiforms, radial line motifs, also kind of on a, a circular theme, and then there are more angular motifs such as triangles, chevrons, zigzags. Sometimes there are lozenges with subdivisions within them forming triangles and they may be picked over. Most of the carving is by picking, I should have said, with a, probably a, a mallet and chisel kind of effect, but there are also incised carvings using the same motifs for the most part. To look again um, at this particular type, the standard megalithic art, as I've called it, 
it's very widespread throughout the country and it can be quite simple, single a couple of carvings on one stone, on the back of a stone, the front of a stone, are more elaborately used here with the zigzags and the triangles and lozenges also. Sometimes it's on corbels in the roof, mostly it's on the orthostats. But in Nauth in particular, and to a lesser extent in some of the other sites, there is not just one phase of carving. One can We can see uh, a number of stages. Like here, there is incised carving, which is overlain by the zigzags, and the same situation on that stone at Nauth too. Sometimes the overlying carvings are, are very different, as we'll see in a minute, but here is a group that I want to draw your attention to, which is called <coughs> recycled style, recycled art, and so-called because Professor Ogan uh, believes that it was used previously in some other type of monument that stood at this site. And we know it's recycled because in the tombs, it's set often right into a socket, for instance, here, ground level conceals these spirals underneath, same in that one, or else it's up in the roof, like here in the big corbel roof of the eastern tomb, where you can see the spirals and zigzags on this corbel run beyond the actual line of the um, supporting corbels. It's interesting because it only has, or predominantly, as it, I suppose, has the spirals and zigzags. It's a very limited repertoire, unlike the standard art that we were looking at earlier with its nine or ten different motifs. Now, as I mentioned, there's also um, carvings which were done on top of older carvings. And this is most dramatically demonstrated with this kind of art, which we've called ribbon line art, uh, simply because it's broader lines, not just a, a thin picked line, but broader ribbon-like lines which curl and curve over the surfaces, not forming distinctive motifs like the standard mechanistic art or the other, the, um, the recycled art. Here's, for instance, two side by side here, and here is the drawing, which are at the outer part of the intersection of um, the cruciform tomb at Nauth. So these carvings were done all in this inner section and um, not, not at all in the outer section, except for the entrance stone at the mouth of the tomb, uh, the curb stone, which is very similar. It's rather similar to the back stone here as well. And the same situation occurs in the, in the Western tomb the curb stone has those carvings and then the inner part, but not the ordinary outer part of the, of the passage. The other dramatic art at Nauth is the large scale curb stone art. Again, it's a sort of a simple description, but it's this dramatic carving that sometimes occurs on top of simpler in this case, a spiral with this big motif occupying the whole surface of the stone. Notice the scale here, a meter wide. So some of these stones are two meters, some are, some are even bigger. And very often it's just a single motif. Concentric circles or spirals are quite common, which occupies the whole surface of the stone. And um, here you can see in the photograph how, again, a big motif picks and um, overlies um, a smaller pick motif here. But in this one, there are smaller motifs that the big secondary, second stage carving seems to have um, kind of gone around. So where else do we find this kind of art? Well, as I mentioned in, in, uh, in Britain, there are some in Anglesey, or Claudia de Gowers in particular, it's quite like the Irish art. And then up in the Orkneys, there's a selection of carvings uh, which are mostly incised and mostly angular. 
this chart from Antonia Thomas's uh, wonderful work on the on that area shows us the the designs. And while many of them are similar to the Irish art, there are differences in that it's very much more the angular in size that occurs. And of course, this art occurs on the megalithic tombs, about nine, I think, passage tombs have it. And also on the settlement sites and the, the big ceremonial buildings at places, notably um, Ness of Broadburg, where there's over 900 surfaces now recorded by Antonia with, with carvings of some kind or another. But I want to draw your attention in particular to one group of um, carvings in, in the Orkney Islands, which have been often seen as showing connections um, with Irish megalithic art. And I want to argue that, in fact, they're very different, not very different, but there are subtle differences, which I think we must, we must uh, take into account. On the top left drawing here, I've put in two of the carvings from uh, passage tombs in the Orkneys, the Ide Manse and Pira Wall, damaged passage tombs, but the design is what we're calling, what I call sea spiral. It's also been called horned spiral, where you've got two spirals connected um, and they're turning in different directions. So it's like an, an developed from a simple sort of a C shape, but turning in and in and in, again, thinking horn is, is a useful description for them. Now, they're also known in other sites and um, the rock art site of Achnebrek, which we had a very interesting talk from this group recently by Aaron Watson, where there are three uh, motifs on the rock of this form. But in each case, again, it's, it's the sea spiral um, accompanied by an, an extra spiral. It's not three interlocked spirals. They're just mainly based on the sea spiral. We also have it in the um, Calder stones in Liverpool on the left of the on, the, on the top left. But they don't, as I say, come into Ireland, except in a, a rather unusual form, which is on a mace head, a flint mace head from uh, Nouth, found in the tomb at Nouth, but of a type that is not known, the mace heads are, of this kind are not known elsewhere in Ireland, but are in, in Britain. So it's almost certain this piece is a, an import. And you can see the sea spiral on the, on the top of that. It's a small piece, only about uh, 70 millimeters in length, but a beautifully made piece. So making comparisons between the Irish spiral designs and these types of spirals in Britain is really not, um, not uh, satisfactory because they, they are they are different. Finally, I want to move on to a topic that um, is, a, is of interest to me because I've been involved in, in uh, publishing it, and that's the sort of relationship between open air rock art and passage to art. We've recently had published this useful book uh, available from the Heritage Council written by Claire Boucher O'Sullivan about Irish rock art in the landscape. And it's got a map um, on the right, which shows us the distribution of the rock art with the prominence down in, in Cork and Kerry, very, very different from the locations of the passage to Mart, which you've got on the left. Uh, rock art also common in, in the eastern Southeast, I should say, and up in County Donegal at the very north. But there's one area uh, where both rock art on outcrops occurs uh, together with passage to art, and that is at, at Loch Crew, where over three hills there is a number of passage tombs, each of which has, has carvings. The dominant, the highest hill is the Cairn T as you can see there on, on the skyline in the right-hand photograph. But in the foothills below that, to the north, 
there are carvings with cup and ring marks, which have only recently been um, identified through fieldwork and published. Although I did discover a late 19th century drawing in the uh, National Library papers uh, recently, as you can see on the bottom left, but it was not a published drawing. And in the upper left photograph, um, you can see uh, stones in the Cairn T, which show cup marks, very, very like what we are finding on the outcrops in the area. So the question is, is it possible that the rock art was already carved and was reused in the passage tombs in, in Loch Crew? Um, or maybe they were added, but certainly that Cairn T in Loch Crew, a lot of the carvings in there are very, very close to rock art. And indeed elsewhere in the Boyne Valley, uh, there are a number of carvings of uh, cup marks, even big ones, on stones which are in a kind of prominent place on curbstones or on the backs of curbstones. So if they were bringing cup marks or sometimes even natural hollowed hollows on stones and selecting them for, for use in, in particular locations. So it's not absolutely certain here, but it does look like there's a relationship between the open air rock art and, and the passage tombs. So just to summarize, the composing of Irish Mechanic art, mainly geometric motifs, this widespread standard megalithic art, the recycled art in the Boyne Valley only, the ribbon line art in, in Louth and Summit Newgrange, the large scale curbstone art at Louth and a little hint of this at Newgrange. And then there's a lot of picking, which I didn't have time to, to go into, um, can be sort of spread out, dispersed picking or amorphous grouping of picking, often overlying older, older carvings. And I think the ultimate background of this has to be in Brittany and Iberia, although the motifs and the designs there are, are quite different, particularly in Brittany, where now it's being discovered that much of the art in Brittany is representative of, say, axes and animals and different things that the people had and, and is that's now being unpicked and identified more, more clearly. So I put in rock art there with a the question mark what the relationship is. <clears throat> clearly the passage to art is different, but there may be the connections with rock art as well. In conclusion, I want to thank a number of um, colleagues and friends who've helped in putting this publication together are the Royal Art Academy and I put in the details of the publication which will be as I say out in the autumn of, of this year. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you very much uh, Elizabeth for this brilliant presentation and uh, yeah it's great to see you. Thank you very much for showing us some uh, very recent research and results from the from the north project and the, the the forthcoming publication and it's so very nice to see all these very interesting connections between rock art in the open air and so rock art in architectures here because you've shown pictures from megalithic monuments but also from uh, stone houses in Orkney based on the work of uh, Antonia Thomas so we have several questions i would like to start with a, a question from uh, dan so the motifs really resemble the bell beaker pottery decorations uh, were there many pottery found in the british isles from the bell beaker period with uh, such motifs um it, there is a certain resemblance but i think it's more because both the type of art uh, or some of the passage to art and the beaker pottery is is geometric in form 
but the dating is wrong. I mean, the uh, beaker material is, is clearly later. So I think it's probably drawing on, you know, general geometric designs, but um, I wouldn't think there's a connection. I think that's one of the surer things that there is uh, in regard to dating, um, with regard to the, the art, um, the two types of art, <clears throat> quite separate. Okay, thank you. And another question from Lisa. Uh, do you think the passage tomb was deliberately built over to incorporate the cup and ring marked rocks? Uh, no, um, maybe I didn't explain very well. The <clears throat> carvings within the tombs at La Croix that I think have similarities with rock art, it's, it's where um, the that the structure of stones are are used perhaps one is taken from outside not quite certain on that of course but <clears throat> it's not incorporating in that they were built over them no it's using them perhaps and very much a perhaps question <clears throat> as um as orthostats or cover stone but particularly orthostats at guarantee Okay, thanks. Thanks for clar clarifying this. Uh, if if I can just follow up on this, because one of the the really striking features of these monuments of these passage tombs in Ireland is these very complex biographies with uh, some rock art being quarried and reused uh, to construct some of the monuments. Or sometimes we have stones coming from previous passage tombs that were uh, reused to build new phases of this passage tomb. So. Could you perhaps uh, tell more about the, the the chronology? What sense do we have about the chronology or possibly the dates of these different phases of rock art that are employed and deployed inside the passage tombs? Hmm. <clears throat> well, we seem to have um, always got incised, the fine line incised carvings at, at quite an early stage because we're getting it right up in the roof, for instance, <clears throat> sorry, at, at Nouth. Um, but in that also, in the inner section of Nouth, the kind of core part of it, we get these um, spirals and zigzag designs, which uh, were found, as I said, sometimes uh, facing back into the tomb rather than being visible or stuck into the ground. And they they seem to be quite early on. Now they're a real um, puzzle because they're so distinctive in their art, uh, and there's nothing exactly like them anywhere else. Maybe at Newgrange, but at Newgrange they're used in the same way. So that's another early phase. But what its background is 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 really a, very difficult to to make suggestions about. And then, as I said, the the standard art which I think runs right through in all the different places. And then particularly at Nauth, we've got the later phases, uh, which are clearly added to the early ones I've been talking about and cut across them. And quite a lot, which I didn't have time to discuss, were um, dressing, picking, uh, obscures earlier carvings in, in a later stage. <clears throat> Though again, there are hints that this may have been going on uh, even even during the building of Newgrange, uh, but it certainly was used to obliterate some of the the earlier carvings too. So it's it's quite complex and difficult difficult to disentangle. Really, very difficult. I think what we're trying to do, and the volume is is documented um, by drawings which were were done over a long period of time. There's very little. Uh, we've done a little bit of experimental three D but it's, it's more the traditional drawings that were, were made by tracing or measuring even, um, which we've put together now as, as the body of documentation. And there's surely room also for further, more fine-tuned um, recording, 3D and other you know, methods like that now. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I think it's time to move to our following speaker. Just before we, we, we do this, I just would like to uh, thank you once more, Elizabeth, for the brilliant presentation. So 
I invite everybody to give final applause.